All right. Let's pray first. Well, Father, we just thank you for this time together and to have been able to share a meal and some fellowship time. And Lord, even to talk about the things of life, <clears throat> the things that do concern you and ways for us to take stands. And Lord, we pray for those who are uh, running for office this year that are, are outspoken uh, and, and want policies and laws to, that would protect the unborn, Lord. We pray that they would uh, be safe, that they would be elected, and that they would be able to see some of the things that they talk about come to be. Uh, Lord, we pray that we would one day start with the issue of life at all ages uh, as a way to start honoring you and that, Lord, I th- you know what the actual first step should be, but my first inclination is that honoring life would be the first step back toward you and would bring <clears throat> your attention back onto our nation, Lord. And so uh, we just ask that you would be with those uh, who have made that made made their intentions known, made their beliefs known, Lord, especially for those who are running for office who are believers, Lord, that their faith would not be compromised and you would just you would protect them heart and and mind, Lord. And now as we get ready to look into your word in Isaiah, we just ask that you would <clears throat> give us understanding this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Alright. So Last week we did 31, and that was a rebuke of Jerusalem uh, and Judah, the the tribes to the south, for trusting in Egypt and looking to them for help rather than looking for God. Uh, I think the charge in the very first part there, especially verse 3, is, well, he ends it with both he who helps will fail and he who is helped will, will fall down, or will fall and will fall down. They all will perish together. So when, when you look for your help in any other direction than from the Lord, you're only looking to the world, you're looking to yourself, you're looking to those who maybe look strong, but are not really because we have to compare them to God, and the Bible tells us He's where our help comes from. And if we look to Him for our help, then uh, we find strength rather than to the world that appears to be strong, like Egypt with their horses and, and all, and their armies. And we know that Egypt was not a help to Israel or to Judah um, in any way. Uh, verse, or, well, starting with verse 4, the second half of chapter 31 talks about how God will himself deliver Israel, um, particularly from the Assyrians, but we even were able to look to the, the end times and God protecting Israel himself uh, and, and restoring them and delivering them and making them uh, basically the center of, of all world power. So we get to 32, and we're going to kind of, again, probably look more to the millennial kingdom than than against the Assyrians, but keep in mind that uh, that that is still a picture of of the Lord delivering His people, delivering Israel and His land from the rest of the world as it sets itself against them. Uh, and even now, just like back then, they don't look to the Lord really for their for their help. They they obviously don't look to Jesus, their Messiah, because they don't believe He's the Messiah. But they also don't pursue God at all, not really, and and the evidence of that is their their social uh, constructs in their in their nation aren't really any different than ours. You know, they have their pride parades, they have the abortion issue, they have all of that, and and they're very liberal in that side of it. So they really don't walk with. You can't even say that they walk with the God of the Old Testament. They have his protection in spite of themselves, just like we do. Even even us in the church, even those of us who are saved, our protection, our our uh, provision of any kind 
for us is not of our own doing ever. It's always of God's and it's always in spite of us because we're still wrestling with our own flesh. And we oftentimes lose that battle. Uh, but we walk in his forgiveness and, and in his grace and mercy. And, and he works in us in spite of us, not because of us. So chapter 32, verse 1 says, Behold, a king will reign in righteousness and princes will rule in just, with justice. A man will be as a hiding place from the, uh, from the wind and a cover from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as the shadow of the great rock in a weary land. The eyes of those who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who, who hear will listen. Also the heart of the rash will, be, or will understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stammerer will be ready to speak plainly. So now you have at least the beginnings of the picture of how things will be set up socially, or, or different things that will overcome uh, in that, those last days or in the, the millennial reign, a king will reign in righteousness. He's obviously not going to reign in his... In, uh, there, there's never been a king who could reign in his own righteousness. Even the kings that were good kings in the Bible, it wasn't because of their own righteousness, but because they sought the righteousness of God and they sought God and they sought the law and they, they tried to reign according to uh, the things that were spoken both by Moses and by the other prophets. Their concern was for honoring God in the land. And that was what made them good kings and made them righteous kings. It wasn't their own righteousness. In fact, a lot of them, even still, you, we see their shortcomings. Uh, we don't have to look far. You can look at David and see his shortcomings. Even though the Bible describes him as a man after God's own heart. And after some of his psalms, though, uh, he confesses his sin before God and asks God to forgive him and asks God to examine him and see if there's any wicked way in him that needs to be dealt with. So he sets a, a great example for us to know that it's not our righteousness that saves us. In fact, Isaiah is going to say, and I think in the, in the later chapters, that our righteousness compared to God's is like filthy rags. You know, and that's been said that that is actually when it says filthy rags you're talking about the rags that a woman would use during her time during her, her uh, monthly time and so that that's pretty gross <laughs> and that's our righteousness compared to God's righteousness something you don't want to touch something you don't you know that defiles and is uh, and, and even when you look in the law, during that time of month, a woman had to go through a cleansing time after that. She was unclean during her, during her period, and she had to go through a cleansing before she could go back into fellowship. And so when Isaiah says that, that that's our righteousness compared to his. So this king, behold, a king will reign in righteousness can only be Jesus. And the princes will rule with justice. Would, would you like to be in a government that ruled with justice instead of, you know, whoever can take the biggest bribe or make the biggest bribe or whatever is going on? It says a man will be as a hiding place from the, uh, from the wind and a cover from the tempest. So they're going to, people are going to take care of each other. They're going to watch out for one another. They're going to protect They're going to be like rivers of water in a dry place and a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. So in the dry and in the heat, they would understand that probably more than most of us, unless you've lived in a desert and, and had to deal with real heat and a real lack of water. And even, even though we lived in the Mojave Desert for two years, it's still... If I would have just lived outside, as as the people in the Middle East did, then, you know, I probably would know even more. But we still had running water in our house, and we had a house to go to. We had shelter. And that's what this is really kind of talking about. But you used water for everything. We didn't have an air conditioner. We had a swamp cooler. 
You know, so you had this big box on top of your roof and water ran through the filter and the air was sucked through the water that was coming up and circulating through your, through your swamp cooler. It wasn't an air conditioner like we know now. And it also helped to put humidity in the air. You know, but by the heat of the day, it was not quite as effective as it was early in the morning or late at night. Um, it, it was still cooler than being outside and being directly in the sun. But, <laughs> you know, when we, moved, when we moved out there in February in 93, it rained for a whole month. I couldn't believe it. Just, just rained. And all these little lake beds and, and little pond beds that are all dried up, they look like nothing, just look like cracked ground, you know, all the rest of the year. It all filled full of water. Man, ducks were flying around all over the place. The desert bloomed out to all these flowers all over the place. And when it stopped, it only took a couple of weeks, man, and it was all dead and stinking. <laughs> Especially the brine shrimp, because if you ever had sea monkeys when you were a kid, or ever, that's what it is. It was just brine shrimp. Well, that all hatched in the, in the muck. That's what brought the birds in. And so when the, when the mud got filled up with enough water that they could hatch and swim around, you could take a cup out and dip it down in there and pick it up and you'd see them swimming around. And <laughs> but when it dried up, man, it smelled like death. It was, it was bad. And, uh, but that was the first year. The second year didn't hardly rain at all. So we, didn't never, we never saw the flowers, never saw the, the birds come in. It was just dry and dusty, and and uh, and I remember shortly after we moved out there, I came home from work, and our, our apartment faced the west, which was kind of cool. The Tapachapi Mountains were there; we could see them, you know, sunsets and all that. <laughs> came home, and Tracy is washing the windows outside. I said, "Well, what you doing?" She said, "I'm trying to wash the windows." I said, yeah, she says. It's not coming off. I said, it's not going to come off, man. What do you mean? I said, because when the Santa Ana winds come, it etches all the windows. The sand blows so hard against your, your house, all your windows look fogged over because they're all sand etched. Like you live in a big sand blaster. Uh, so a man who is seeking righteousness and justice is going to be one who's going to be a protection for everybody around him and a provider. The water, I think, uh, um, speaks of, of a provision and a refreshing. If you've ever gone a long time without drinking and, and all of a sudden you have water and you drink a lot, <laughs> you know, right? It takes, it, it's really good to have cold water when you're very, very thirsty. It was very refreshing. In the shadow of the rock, hiding from the, from the sun. Uh, the eyes of those who, who see will not be dim, and the ears of those who hear will listen. So in that, in that thousand year reign, no more hearing problems for, for those who trust in the Lord, no seeing problems for those, no glasses, can you imagine? Your eyes never, you, which kind of insinuates too, they're going to get old, but their strength and, and their abilities, their physical abilities, won't diminish. You know, ours do. Now then we'll have our new bodies. We will have already been resurrected and, and taken out and come back with the Lord when he establishes that time. So we'll have our new bodies, but their physical bodies, their earthly bodies that will still be able to reproduce won't get old like ours do. It's going to be more like pre-flood where they live for a long long time uh, there's another place that says that if somebody dies at 100 years old they die young you know i remember waking up on my 50th birthday saying you know i think i got another 50 in me <laughs> but i knew i would be old you know, i've had family members who lived to be over 100 years old so to say that's not necessarily that big a deal but um but they were old when they when they died some of them. My grandpa had an aunt who was 106 and still volunteered at the old folks' home. So, you know, that uh, says something for the determination of that side of the family. Uh, but anyways, um, just the difference in the... Um, I was listening to David Jeremiah 
this week he's been talking about prophetic things and that kind of stuff in the end times on his radio show and he mentioned that in that thousand year reign a lot of people believe that the earth will be healing and going back toward that time of, of a pre-flood uh, pre-flood time uh, the heart of the rash will understand knowledge right? so people who make foolish decisions who are just don't really consider consequences or or as we'll see when we get into Luke uh, in the next week or so, they don't count the cost of anything first. They just rush into doing things or they, they make rash decisions. They're going to understand knowledge. They're going to want to know. They're going to want to understand knowledge. They're going to want the knowledge. They're going to want to learn. They're not going to be rash anymore. And the tongue, the person who has a hard time speaking, the one who stutters and stammers, says will be ready to speak plainly. And so some of the stuttering that problems that people have are because they can't get their thoughts completely ordered right and so they they hesitate they stutter they don't get the words out right and, and many people something triggers something in them that they're able to overcome that um, some of it's just practice it's training they really have to concentrate when they talk but this says they're going to be ready to speak plainly like any time you ask them a question, they'll be able to give an answer without stuttering and stammering over their, their words and their thoughts. The foolish person will uh, no longer be called generous, nor the miser said to be bountiful. So <laughs> you have, and, and the generous is not, this, uh, <clears throat> It's, it's, how am I trying to say this? See, now I'm stuttering. Then I won't, then I won't stutter anymore. Um, we, we have a, a sometimes a, a wrong way of looking at things. And, and maybe this speaks more to just their own understanding of who they are. They won't consider themselves generous if they just make foolish decisions. Right? And the one who's a miser who stores everything up, they won't be called bountiful. They won't be called smart. And we, people that are, are misers even today really aren't smart. It's not that they've had a, a good, solid ideology to go along with their saving or their withholding. It is, this is mine and nobody's going to have it, and they stockpile for themselves, and they don't let anybody. They, they would never think of giving to an organization or helping a neighbor with anything. They're always going to make an excuse for that in that the other person was foolish with their money, and I've been wise with my money. Why would I give it to them? Right? Why would I help anybody around me? Uh, and And it's not... That's not the same mentality of, all right, I need to save for my family. I need to save for a future. I need to save for retirement and get my things in order and keep it in order. This is, I'm not helping anybody. This is all mine, 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 mine. This is mine. This is, I'm just hoarding whatever. Even if it's not hoarder, like fill your house full of junk. But this is mine and nobody's touching it. That's, that's more the miserly person. That's the, the mean spirited or the, the angry person in what they've done and and they're mad about everybody else's shortcoming there's no room for a real reason as to and we know the foolish person in the beginning is addressed too but there's no there's never any reason in the mind of a miser to help anybody everybody is where they are of their own doing and so now you're looking at yourself you're looking at other people and there's no consideration for a relationship with the lord not on anybody's part and again, the foolish person who just throws away money and gives to every everything and, and without any consideration is is uh, sometimes looked at as a very generous person, but they're they may be foolish with the things that God has given them and give away to everybody and everything. Uh, and you hear the stories and you hear the people on, especially the televangelists and all the, the swindlers out there who are preying on those people who aren't going to, you know, 
be smart or wise with what God's given them. Uh, verse 6, for the foolish person will speak foolishness uh, and his heart will work iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error against the Lord, to keep the hungry unsatisfied, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. Also the schemes of the schemer are evil. He devises wicked plans to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaks justice. But the generous man devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. So there's a contrast of the hearts of those who are, who are uh, either withholding or, or giving. Uh, verse 9 says, Rise up, you women who are at ease. Hear my voice, you uh, complacent daughters, and give ear to my speech. In a year and some days you will, ha you will be troubled, you complacent woman, uh, for, the, for the vintage will fail, the gathering will not come. Tremble, you women uh, who are at ease. Be troubled, you complacent ones. Uh, strip yourselves, make yourselves bare, and gird sackcloth on your waist. And so you, there's no provision. And what happens? What happened in this? Uh, and what was going to happen to Jerusalem is they're going to be besieged by Assyria, and to the point of there's not enough food. There's not enough enough wine, and wine wasn't you know there to to just make them drunk, but it was there to uh, sterilize your water, your drinking water, and that kind of thing. Where they're not going to have what they need because they're complacent because they're not working, and eventually Assyria is going to come. Now, Assyria did destroy cities in Judah, not just in Israel. You got to remember, this is talking about Jerusalem and not all of Judah. So there were like forty-two cities that were destroyed by Assyria before they got to Jerusalem, and and siege that. Um, and so to, to be complacent is obviously not good. The Bible does talk about that in other places. And, and the, the strip yourselves and make yourselves bare and gird sackcloth on your waist doesn't just speak of mourning, but it, it also speaks of being in bondage and uh, what the Assyrians did to people. I mean, they were not... The ones they let live, they put hooks in their jaws and marched them naked across the... the they were horrible people. When they came into a city, they would take all the, all the members of the noble family, uh, nobility, and, and behead them and pile their heads up outside of the, of the cities. And I mean, they were, they were a bloodthirsty bunch. This was not good people that were, that were coming and going to lay siege. And it should have scared them more uh, than it did. People shall mourn upon their breast. For the, uh, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, and on the land of my people will come up thorns and briars, yes, on all the happy homes in joyous cities, because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be des deserted, the forts and towers will become uh, lairs forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks, until the Spirit is poured upon us, from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted as a forest. So we can take this literally, and we know the descriptions uh, of some writers about what the Holy Land looked like before, uh, you know, pre-1948 especially, uh, and we know how God has changed it uh, after that. But even in their time, like uh, when when they would come into an area, they would deforest the whole area. They would take down everything. It, it was just, and when it says it's wild, it's not just wild. Like when we clear cut something around here, actually, maybe it is similar to that. If you ever been through a clear cut, like some of the, the state land, uh, they will let logging companies come in and log a certain area and clear cut the area. So you might... All of a sudden, you're where you used to go <laughs> squirrel hunting, where all the acorns were. Now there's no oak trees left. You know, they just clear cut a whole field out, and what grows up in there is nothing but thorns and bramble, 
and it, you can hardly walk through it. Uh, in fact, usually you get a few yards into that and you wish you hadn't, because <laughs> now at, at best you're going to turn or try to turn around and walk back, and you have a decision to make. Uh, but anyways, that's what, that's what was going to happen. That's how God is describing this. This is not going to be a livable place, and it's in, it, it shows us... <clears throat> It shows us what happens when our hearts are not for God. Right? When, when a nation's heart is turned against God, when the people are turned against God, your land becomes kind of unlivable. And whether it's actual briars like Israel turned into just dust and rocks and briars, or whether it's just a place that's full of danger, full of... of you know, just there's there's no place in a city that you should go. I mean, when we first moved down from up north to Galesburg, we would go to Kalamazoo and walk around. And there were certain areas where you could go and walk around and, and be safe. And even at night, you could go and walk around and be safe. Now, even during the daytime, they tell you, you know, I was told by Roger when he was, uh, and he, I think he still is a chaplain up there, with the police department, he told me, he said, tell your people, don't come to Kalamazoo unless you absolutely have to, at any time. Because it's not good. You know? Now, I, j I just drove through there the other day, and the, the facade, everything looks normal. I mean, there's still lots of construction like there always had been, and arrows to move over when you didn't think you were going to have them, and you know, you come around the corner or whatever, and it looks the same, but... You know, the, the difference is back then when we first came down, if they took a, a, an illegal gun off the street, Roger said the, the, they would go down and they would celebrate after work after their shift was over. He said now they take them off every single day. Nobody celebrates anymore because they, they take illegal guns off the street every day up there. <coughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's... It, it literally happened to Israel, but it's, it's a, a figurative or symbolic of what happens to a nation, to a city, to a people when you start moving away from God. It's not long before you have no respect for life. And when you have no respect for life, you have no respect for property. You have no respect for life at any age. In fact, the younger, the more destructive you're willing to be. We, we are literally destroying our generations that are coming behind us. Right? If, if we don't, if, if our nation doesn't get them in the womb, they're willing to get them out of the womb. And, and if they can live past five, well, for, now, now they want to let them do hormone suppression at four years old because somebody says, mm, I'm a girl. And he doesn't even know what he's saying. He's just playing. He's just pretending. Right? And so now we're, we're willing to just destroy their bodies at that age. And, and then when they get older, if there's anything left, we feed them to the wolves. And we, and we tell them younger and younger, you can make your own choices. You don't have to live. And we've just subverted any authority in our nation. And what happens to a nation when that happens is what happened in Germany. It's what happens in other places where, where the socialism and the communism came in and said, we're the protectors, we'll put down the unrest, we'll put everything in order. And when they do, they find out that everybody is now under suppression, not submission, but suppression from a tyrannical government. So they, they breed the reason to have to come in and be that. And now it's a place where you can't walk through, where a place where you get trapped, where you get stuck easily. It's a wild place. But verse 15 gives us a little hope, doesn't it? Until the Spirit is poured out upon us from on high. And, and we look back, 
if you're a born again Christian. And this is why we need to teach church history. This is why you need to teach the book of Acts because in, in verse by verse through the Bible, but if we don't, we don't even know that this happened. How many, how many churches at, at least, <laughs> I mean, they can't seem to get out of the second chapter of Acts, but at least the Pentecostals teach about Pentecost and know that the Spirit came. When you have other churches that won't even touch it, don't want to talk about it and avoid anything of, of spiritual content. And it, it's just a good uh, a way to encourage and, and then affirm. And then pretty soon they're just like the, just like the world. They're just going to encourage and affirm. And we're not going to talk about sin because that makes people feel bad. Well, you know what? Hell's going to make people feel hot. So maybe you got to talk about sin and make them feel bad now. All right. That's me. See, I get a little fleshy too. Let's read this up and finish this up. Anyways, the 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 promise of the Spirit being poured out from on high, and the wilderness becomes fruitful, and and the fruit field is counted as a forest. <clears throat> Verse sixteen says, "Then justice will will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field." The work of the righteous will be peace. The effect of the righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings and in quiet resting places. Through hail, or though hail comes down on the forest, the city is brought low in humiliation. Blessed are you who sow beside all the waters, who send out freely uh, the feet of the ox and the donkey. So, the peace of God will reign. Those who, who's, uh, verse 20 just reminds me of like Psalm 1. Right? That, that those who would seek wisdom would be like trees planted by the, by the rivers. Right? And, and, <clears throat> So it's not all bad news. It is, until it's not. It's like te technology is good until it's not. Well, the news is, is bad until it's not. There's the promise of, of the coming of Jesus. There's the promise of the Holy Spirit being poured out. There's a, a promise of a new day, a promise of, a, of the millennium, a promise of, a, of a, the earth changing, even though... We know when we go to Revelation and read about the millennium, the little bit that's there, we find out there is another rebellion put down, and then the judgment comes. And then what comes after that? The new creation, the new heavens, the new earth. And can't imagine. We can read things like this and see there's going to be things for us to do. There'll be things for things to be done in the millennium. I'm, I'm sure there'll be things to be done in the new creation. But will be it'll be righteousness, it'll be justice. And I think when you talk about righteous, when you talk about justice, you have to talk about the millennial time. Justice is served. When justice is done, now you have the new heavens and the new earth. Justice is completed, I think, at the great white throne judgment. And and it's meted out there. And you either get your reward and go into the new heavens and the new earth or you get your punishment and you enter into the lake of fire uh, but I'm sure that'll make some people mad too not anybody that's here tonight I don't think but <clears throat> uh, anyways it's good to know that God loves us it's good to know that that we live under his grace and mercy. It's good to know that everything that is done in his honor, for his honor, for his glory, is done by him through us. And it's our, our participation in is to be willing to do what he's asked us to do and, and to not be complacent and to not just kind of sit back and try to ride out the storm. Because there is no riding out the storm. Right? And uh, 
Yep, we look up. When we see these things begin to happen, Jesus told us in Matthew to look up because our redemption is near. Paul told us it's more near than, than it ever has been. It's closer than it's ever been. That the day is far spent. But at the same time, we're given instructions to do the work of our Father and to be at His work until He comes. Okay. Amen? Let's pray. So Lord, we do ask that You would help us with those things, that You would empower us to do Your will, to do uh, the things that are right. Lord, to be righteous and to pursue righteousness even though... It, it, Lord, that we would, we would pursue Your righteousness that we would let you make it manifest in our hearts and in the things that we do and the things we say. That we would submit to you and to your righteousness and to your justice. That we would submit to your love and your grace and your mercy and receive your joy and your peace so that others would have hope, that they would see that we have hope in the face of all kinds of wickedness and evil. And we still have hope because we trust in you. And so, Lord, please, don't just preserve us, but use us to glorify and honor you and bring attention to your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.